Let's discover the source of human pain, whether it's in the form of loneliness, anxiety, worry. Let's expose the cause so that we are no longer unconscious victims of it all day and night long. I'm talking about mental pain, emotional pain, anything that upsets you, makes you scared. A human being is pained when his preference meets the fact. There it is. Now let's look at it very slowly and deeply. <clears throat> you have preferences. You wish another person to behave in a certain way toward you. You want him to be kindly. You want him to be loyal. You want him to say that he likes you. That's your preference, right? Another preference would be that you want to feel secure in this society. When you do all sorts of things you can think of to feel secure, like getting a lot of money so you feel financially secure, or you feel want to feel secure within yourself mentally so you read a lot of books thinking that ordinary acquisition of knowledge is going to make you feel secure. So you have all these preferences the way you want life to be. When you go to that place, you are expecting certain things to happen. The boss to give you a raise, to be a very entertaining movie, on and on and on. You walk out of the door of your house with a basket filled with preferences. This is what I want, what I expect. So you take your basket full of preferences out in the world and the movie for which you paid all that money was boring. The raise you asked for wasn't forthcoming. The security you expected from the world isn't felt by you. In other words, no one fulfills you. There is always disappointment. There is always emptiness. The answer to your worldly prayer is a worldly no. That causes pain. And I want you to not miss the next point. You don't get what you expected, so you feel pain, and now you feel rewarded. Well, if, I, if that expectation wasn't fulfilled, look at the one that was. My old pal pain will always come to my rescue. He will never, never fail, right? You've got it fixed just right so that you never lose. You always win. When you don't get what your demand, your demand is out in the world, you always have a fallback position, which is to feel pain and its thousands of varieties. The pain that the world is so cruel and nobody cares for you and everybody is out to exploit you and then toss you aside. You've always got a fresh supply of pain to fall back on. Now, let's see what would happen if you handled your day in a different way. You get up in the morning, 
You went out into the world basketless. No demands, no preferences, no wish for how others should talk to you, treat you, whether they come into your life or go into your life. No preferences at all as to how they behave towards you. If you had no preferences, you would have no crisis, therefore no compulsive need to fall back into suffering to support you, so you think. Well, look what we have discovered already, that if your whole system could be without false preferences, invented desires, then when you went out into the world, there was no way you can be disappointed. Therefore, no need to call upon, call upon your treacherous ally, pain and suffering. Now, look at, look at the difference in your life. You go out shopping, you go out doing business, you go out and meet other people, people of the opposite sex, maybe, friends. You go out and meet the world, but there is no, absolutely no demand in you at all for anything from them. You don't want anything. You don't expect anything. You don't look out furtively out of the corner of your eyes, wondering whether you're going to get what you want from them. That used to be your way of life, which was the way of pain, right? Now, you go out, you, you, you really honestly don't care how you get treated. You know why, don't you? You don't care how you're treated because there's nothing there that requires flattery, money, sex, whatever, from the outer world. There is the absence of the preference person. Get it now and connect this with yourself. When you have preference in how you should be treated, oh, you're in trouble. You've proved that by personal experience, aren't you? I want that Look, here, here's how example how the mind operates. The man goes down to his club, his dumb club. All, all clubs are dumb. Am I going to get it? <laughs> the, the, the preference soaked man puts on his little uniform of the night and goes down to his club. And he told his wife just before he left, I think tonight they're going to honor me for being the, the chief raccoon of the year. <laughs> Meeting starts at 8, right? And after long, boring introductions, long, boring speeches, long, boring reading of the minutes, which takes hours, <laughs> 9 o'clock comes, 9.30 comes, he knows about to be break up, but break up, and all the time he's waiting, right, to be honored as the chief raccoon of the year. And it doesn't happen. Pity his poor wife when he gets home, right? He's going to have to take it out on someone. He's, he's, he's no man. He's not a raccoon and he's not a man even. See? He comes home, he has to strike out and tell her, look, I've been a member for 15 years, and Bill Smith has only been a member for five months. He was honored last month, and I thought, surely my turn was next. All right, example, and it fits perfectly, doesn't it? You see other people getting honors, you see them getting lovers, you see them getting what you call security, and you put your preferences out, and because you do, you have guaranteed yourself in your little self-trickery something to do with yourself after that dull, boring, senseless meeting. What you can do until you 
mercifully fall asleep at night, what you can do is be all involved with yourself and your rage and making yourself very old, making yourself very desolate, making yourself a very unpleasant human being to be around, right? right? Now suppose he came to our class and heard these things. He could begin to understand something which he didn't want to understand all these years, which is that the way he thinks is what causes his problem, and that's it. The way you think is what causes your problem. And we could tell him to examine the way you think, examine the results of the way you send ideas out into the world, examine the results of it and see, see your mistake which you're, you're nowhere near, sir. It's gonna take you a long time. That's why we have so many classes here and so many other activities, because we've got so much work to do much and as fast as we can go. Sir, you have to see that you really don't have any life at all, but you're trying to pretend that you do. And one, one of his preferences that he sends out into the world, oh, heaven help any man or woman still trapped by this, is honors from this world. And isn't it astonishing? No, not really. Isn't it too bad? that when everybody plays the game of you honor me this month, I'll honor you the next, and we'll both feel secure that they all drift, no matter how honored they are. So, so you were elected president of the society 10 times in a row. Your name is in the local paper, and everybody knows all about you. Isn't it pathetic? That's a good word. Isn't it pathetic that no one sees that your reward is no reward at all. So you're going to have to do some work. You're going to have to straighten out the way you think, the way you go stumble through your day. You're going to have to make experiments, and here's how. Here's what an experiment in this matter consists of. You go through the market, you go to the office, you visit with friends, you talk to strangers, you talk to anyone you talk to, and you notice how you are constantly projecting your preferences out to them as to how they should respond to you. Already you're a fake, because now you're going to try to act intelligent so that he will respond to you as an intelligent human being. Already, you're going you're gonna to fake sincerity. You're going to fake whatever you usually fake in order to get what you call the proper response from him. And all this is unseen by you. The whole world of trickery is unseen by the person who plays tricks and therefore plays a trick on himself, the trick of getting farther away from reality, therefore deeper into pain. Your experiment is to be with one person or 50. The experiment is to be in a social situation, a work situation, and want absolutely nothing from it. Nothing. Wow, this is going to take some tearing down of the haunted house, isn't it? And I'll tell you, tell you what your first enormous task is to actually see while you're standing there talking to that boss, talking to the pretty girl, talking to the little child, talking to anyone that unknown to you for all this time, you have been sending out your preferences as to how they are going to see you and respond to you so that you can take their purely mechanical response back and say, see, I am confirmed as being a witty person. I made him laugh. I am an intelligent person. He asked me a question about something. See, you're unconsciously using, playing the game. You know what the game of handball is? You played handball in school, haven't you? 
throw the ball against the wall and it bounces back. You're throwing the ball of your preference out against the wall, hoping that it'll come back to, the, to you in a favorable way so that you score points. Now, this is what you have to see, and it is extremely subtle. You don't know you're doing it. Unfortunately for you, you were still in the mire of wanting to be liked. Well, let me, let's get rid of that right now. How many of you have ever wanted someone else to like you? How many of you wanted hundreds of people to like you? How many of you were ever really liked? See, the whole thing is foolish. They don't like you anyway. They like the counterfeit you who was performing all these fake magic acts. Ledger domain, is that the word? I don't know. All these magic acts so that they would look at you and applaud. What a wonderful lover you are. Oh, what a generous person. And you smile so sweetly. Even you can't swallow that. <laughs> no wonder at the end of the day you are psychologically worn out, aren't you? Now, according to the laws of nature, it is legitimate to be physically tired. That's the way nature made it. You work all day, a certain time at night, the body says, I need to rest, and so you obey that dictate, and you rest, in the morning you get up fresh. You must never get psychologically tired. If you do, it's simply because you are tossing out these demands, hoping well, someone will hear them, you can intimidate them into fulfilling them. And since the whole thing is a horror movie, you are tired at the end of the day, and here's the worst part of it. The next morning, you pick up the little basket again, and you start all over again, just as if you hadn't done it 50,000 times before. Isn't it about time that some night when you go home dragging yourself into the bedroom or into the living room, onto the couch, isn't it about time that you just lie there in bed and use bedtime for true spiritual growth? By the way, I will tell you that at nighttime, when you relax, that is the time when dark forces do try to take you over. Have you ever noticed that when you get careless and you are physically tired, there's no excuse. You can be psychologically, spiritually alert even when the body is tired. What you have to do is lay there on that bed. Do, do it every night from now on. Oh, wow, look what you're recovering. Instead of going to sleep crabby, how many go to sleep crabby? How many get up crabby? How many are crabby at noon? Four, five, I think we've covered the whole day. Question, when you go to sleep crabby, what kind of a person are you sleeping with? That's why you have bad dreams. That's why, that's why very uh, shameful and embarrassing things happen to you in your dreams because you went to bed crabby and asleep. You will stay awake as your eyelids start to flutter a little bit. You can tell when you're dozing off. You will use the state between being completely awake and when you fall asleep, you will use that period of time, whether it's five minutes or five hours, you will begin tonight to use that time to work on yourself. And to work means to stay alert as to what's going through you, your feelings, your mind. Be aware of how you agitatedly shift your physical position. You're very nervous in bed, things like that. 
And notice, here's another thing. Maybe you'll notice this for the first time when you get full awareness of that. You'll notice that for several hours, you were actually in a physically uncomfortable position and you never knew it. You were at an odd little angle, perhaps, or your legs were twisted in some way. You will become physically aware as part of the exercise and get a position where you can do the spiritual preliminary lesson of letting go of the physical body. Remember how many times we've said that a per perfect place to start is with physical things. Notice the clinch fist, notice the, the sad face, things like that. You practice this at night. Notice you're physically uncomfortable, how nervous and restless you are. And, and, and you'll finally find out that you can find a physically uh, comfortable position. It may change from throughout the night, of course, but you'll be physically relaxed. And remember the rule. If you make even a conquest by being aware of yourself and then getting physically comfortable and really relaxed, see the tense and all that, when you do that, the body, I guarantee you, will send a message to your mind and your emotions and say, the body will send the message that says, follow me. That's right. And after an argument, a loud argument, the emotions and the mind will gradually give in. Do you know what's happening to you? Something spiritual. Remember another rule. You, you can't do anything for yourself. What you can do is yield to what can do everything for you. Isn't it, isn't it a great thing, therefore, to know that there's no way you can rescue yourself? Isn't that going to force you to give up your false moves, your false attempts? And right in front of you in the darkness there, the miracle will become apparent to you inside of you of what is happening. And you will feel yourself as a new kind of person. Right there, right there in that bed as you're, as you're drifting off. You will feel a spiritual feeling, a knowledge, clear, definite, absolute, that you are being taken over by something new. You're, what was old is being displaced by something new. And you see it so clearly, and you see it in all your parts, all your centers. What happens at the start, and all this is for your experimentation, what happens is this highly desirable condition, which is known, known as first a slower mind than a silent mind. Wouldn't you like to be free of mental attacks all day long as well as at night? Over a period of time, as you practice this, as you practice detaching yourself for, from preference during the day, and then bring what you've learned about that into the night, you will find that your preferences, having felt cheated during the day, are really going to go to work at you at night. You know, look, there is a law of mechanicalness. And since dark forces are on the level of mechanicalness, no wonder they keep going so fast and furious. But there's another law that says consciousness breaks mechanicalness. So your preferences, which are getting pretty mad because you don't love them anymore, your preferences will try to enter you at night, but you are waiting for them. I want to change that sentence a little bit. It was correct in itself. You are, are waiting for them. Truth is waiting for them. <clears throat> and if you're lying there, completely relax, watching how the, the, the thoughts switch and how they take you over and, and, and how you, you forget yourself right in bed. It, one, one little thing you can do is to change your physical position as a means of waking up. Remember I said shake your head when you're walking, ar walking around? Shake your head just a little bit. Don't let people see you doing it. They'll wonder about you. 
But at night, ch change your physical position, and now the body has entered into an alliance with your mind and your emotions and your spirit. And that will help you to shake off the dark thoughts that are trying to take you over. And they want to take you over as you're falling asleep in order to sleep with you. Well, they have, haven't they? Huh? What do you think makes you twist and jerk around so violently? What, th what do you think makes a nightmare? What makes, what makes you stay awake so that you can't fall asleep? What do you think causes all, all this great despair at night when you, when you come face to face with all your fakery of the day and now there's no one to impress, no one to send your preferences out to, and you're laying, you're laying all there. You see, when you're in a position of relaxation, starting to be in it, what has been taking you over begins to feel that you're going to boot them out. All the dark forces feel that you're going to boot, boot them out. And so they will fight back and try to make you agitated and nervous so that they can stay with you all night long. Your part, once more, is to lay back there and stay awake. O open your eyes, by the way. Don't close your eyes. Open your eyes, and even the darkness of the room, you can see the, the window over there, you can see the white table over there. Open your eyes physically and look around the room. Just look around, you see? See how that helps us break it? Just do that during the day, you do that at night too. That helps to break it. The physical awareness of it will seep into the, into the inner awareness of it too. And little by little, as you work at night, the night will change, which is really you changing. And every morning after that, when you start this nighttime work, you'll get up in the morning, yeah, you're going to still take the basket of preferences with you, but guess what? You used to take 100 after you try this night work, 99, 98, 97. And then as you go out into the world, where you used to demand something from someone instead of, oh, how beautiful, instead of demanding something from them, something foolish, guess what? You saw through him. You saw through her. And your hand clapped to your forehead and you said, how could I have ever wanted anything from him? Isn't that the end of your preference as far as that person is concerned? Or envying, envying someone whom you think has more than you. And you look at his pathetic face. You, you look at her hard, shrewish face. And, and you, want, you wanted her to give you approval. A, a woman who's utterly in self-disapproval self and self-condemnation. That is how it goes. Oh, yes, if you carry a, a heavy basket in one hand, you're going to walk tilted, aren't you, off balance, and you're going to feel uncomfortable, and you're not going to be walk very smoothly. You're going to sway down the sidewalk. Pretty soon, it'll get down to where you have no preferences at all, and you can toss the basket away, and you walk balance, and that's what we're after. Summary, your preferences are leading you into dark places which you do not see. Use nighttime work to dissolve preferences, and when they are dissolved, when you go out into the world, instead of wanting something, you will simply see something, you will see everything, and you will see it clearly, because that is how truth sees it, and you are now seeing it from truth instead of from your old nature. And in that perfect seeing is perfect life. Truth, in fact, possesses the virtues that human beings imagine they have. Only God, only truth, is naturally and truly virtuous. One of the virtues that truth has toward drifting humanity is a persistent appeal to unvirtuous humanity 
to listen to it and follow truth's messages. Truth is always, now I want you to listen carefully to this, truth is always giving every lost human being an opportunity to hear the message that they are traveling by the wrong map. In this class, in this room, we have concentrated people and lessons, concentrated them in telling you that you are lost and how to be fine, found. However, everywhere outside of this room, in every country of the world, in any, every village, in every mountaintop, in every desert, truth is always operating wherever humanity is to correct humanity. It's compassionate, it's good, it's loving, it's extremely persevering in telling people you are going wrong, here is how to go right. Example, in everyday life, in the business world, the family life, socially, everywhere, a person has an opportunity to be confronted by himself, he has an opportunity to be confronted by, him, by himself and see what he's really, really like, and that's the opportunity. That is the chance right now in billions and trillions of uh, uh, places and people around the world, everybody, the, the worst off person, wherever he is, in South America, in Europe, Australia, he has the chance Right where he is, the man who's working at book, bookkeeping in China, the woman who is repairing a sail on her husband's boat in New Zealand, right while they are working at something, they have a chance to confront, to see, confront their wrongness at the moment that is happening. She makes a mistake in stitching the sail in the boat in Wellington, New Zealand, and gets mad. Ugh. My husband's gonna bawl me out, why did I do that dumb thing? At that moment, truth is giving her, and the bookkeeper, wherever, giving him a chance to see himself making a mistake at the moment he makes it that. That is opportunity, that is compassion. Never, never, ever again believe that truth is like you are hard and harsh and wanting to hurt you. Always believe that truth is the opposite of what you are. I want therefore you to know at the very start here now that you have a chance to change yourself at every single second of your day, and so does that man in Italy, that woman in Spain. So does everyone have that chance if they will learn how to take it. You see, those people in all those other places don't know how to take it. You have to learn how to use the opportunity. If you don't know how to use it, you're not gonna use it, and you're gonna continue as you are. Now, that is what we are doing in this class, in these meetings, in sending out books, and sending out our information, in placing ads, and in going in other publicity places. We are trying to tell people that you have a chance that you don't know about, a whole new existence that you don't know anything about. And if you don't come and listen, or if you don't read the literature, maybe you are in Wellington, or you're in Spain, if you read the literature and look at it carefully, that will give you the opportunity to remain in Spain, or France, or England, wherever you are, to remain there and use that moment by moment chance you have of facing yourself as you are in order to change what you are. Now here's what happens. Gracious God gives everyone 
the open door to using daily existence to rise above this time life. Most people will refuse the gracious invitation. Most are so happy in being lost, they say no to it. These are the people who suffer and reject the truth. These are the majority of people who suffer and fight the lesson. Now follow. Every time you make a mistake, you suffer. There is no mistake without pain. The very fact that you made a mistake means you're apart from reality, therefore there will be a consciousness, a feeling of being wrong. This is why you suffer, because you're a mistake-making machine. The world out there suffers from their mistakes of being greedy, of being hateful, of condemnation of everything and everyone instead of seeking an explanation they condemn. The world is a mass of suffering. Now let's see what the world does. 50,000 times a day, an individual, it goes that fast. Bang, 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 bang. In one hour you can suffer a thousand times easily. The world encounters an experience in which they didn't get what they want, what something thwarted them, and that causes pain, that causes agony, that causes anguish. The right use of the anguish is love. The love of God, by telling you, you can use that anguish. They don't use it. Instead, they fight. They suffer and fight. The fighting, in turn, induces more suffering, more anguish. The anguish causes more fighting. The more fighting causes more anguish. Back and forth, back and forth. The opposites operating on the intellectual center. So that they don't learn. Therefore, the choice to fight is the same as the choice to continue in greater intensity to suffer agony. All covered, all being escaped with activities, but you know that story. We here in this room have started to do different by being different. And we're sending that message out to the world who is not using their anguish right. The world suffers and fights. We also suffer, but we yield. We yield to the lesson in the suffering. Of course there's pain there. You know that. That's your life. That's you. You and your anguish are one thing. Sometimes very cleverly pushed aside for the moment while you enjoy the, the dinner, while you've got some exciting prospect ahead of you for the next hour. Always suppressed, always suppressed, but always there. We have determined to drop fighting Suffering and fighting, we've determined to drop suffering and fighting and replace that with suffering and yielding in order to yield so completely to the lesson in the pain that the pain, the pain now has no choice but to disappear from our lives. Little by little, but very definite. Now I want you to ponder long and hard the difference between the way you used to be and the way the world still is and what you can now do with the suffering that you have. Don't, whatever you do, fall in love 
with your self-lacerations, with your self-anguish, instead fall out of love with it. No. <coughs> this is an example of how loving truth, passionate truth, gives you a chance to put something on your side instead of putting things against you. See, remember the phrases we often use, working for ourselves instead of working against, putting good things on our side instead of putting bad and punishing things on our side. Think of a, a scale, you know the scale that has two arms on it with two little cups to put things in. Think of that scale and we'll get a nice little example out of it. Just now, the scale of your life is weighted down with negative things, is it not? Uh, this is an example of how you can put uh, things on your side. The scale is weighted down on the heavy side, heavy spirited, heavy hearted, uh, glad that other people can't see how dreary you really are, and, which is wrong by the way, you know, that's another picture you have of someone who's successfully escaping the condemnation of the world for being sad. Be sad to yourself and forget the world. Be sad, face the fact and understand it out of existence. Everything we learn here, all the insights that we have yielded to, will finally go on the opposite cup, which is up high now, right? It has nothing in it. Yours is weighted down with the rocks of depression and self-pity. Every time you take a truth, take a suffering, and yield to the lesson in it, you put something in the upper side of the cup, then it begins to tilt just a little bit more, a little bit more, until finally you're 51% in favor of yourself. Then it goes fast. Now listen to the beauty of the ease of this lesson of adding to the right instead of trying to get rid of the wrong. Knowing that you did something wrong, knowing it becomes your beautiful chance for ignoring it. Now, you are self captivated by your wrong and all day long you like to dwell on it. How bad you are, how miserable you are, how fickle you are, how weak you are. And so every day you put things on the wrong side. See, you don't want to discover the secret of ignoring anguish out of existence. And if you see the secret of ignoring it out of existence, not giving it improper attention. You, first you have to give it right attention, then you must not give it wrong attention. That is, oh, look how bad off I am, how persecuted I am, how I'll never make it, and all that. That's wrong attention. When you give it right attention, which is knowing that it's there, you can then begin to safely and spiritually ignore it so that it falls away over, the, over your not feeding it anymore. Therefore, as it, it falls off the scale, it melts down and runs away, that happens as you add true virtue, truly positive things to the upper side, the upper cup, the other side, which begins to go down and down, and then your life is weighted with good things, right? Now, now you know the order of things. You must first give attention to what is negative, to what is wrong. That's a basic lesson. Once having done that, you must not making the mistake, make the mistake of being fascinated by evil in order to maintain your still false connection with evil because it gives you a sense of existence, a sense of identity. You must have the courage to let go of what you have first seen. And the devil will trick you all the time, threaten you with non-existence, with evaporation, unless you hang on to it. And you've got to be smarter than evil, and you can be smarter. Here's how. Just keep adding, putting on your side, yielding to all the lessons so that you know, one day you get 10, that's still not enough, but it lowers that one, and that one is finally, because there's nothing in it anymore, it begins to evaporate more and more and more until... Increasingly, every day, you have 
the solid, the solid truth. There's no shaking back and forth anymore. See, when you get a little bit of knowledge, but not, not a whole lot, you still can be tempted, can't you? Be shaken, and the scale goes like that all day long, and you shake with it, right? Ah, once it hits the, the platform beneath the whole scale structure, you're solid, you're settled. Nothing can shake you. There's no way imps and devils and wrong attitudes can ever leap up to the other side of the scale and get it in any, get in there anymore. It's too high for them. So you're on solid ground. Let's, let's find an example now of, of how you were doing a wrong thing without realizing it. Suppose you went out to a party, went out anywhere, and someone whom you considered to be a friend was just rude to you. You know, just plain old rudeness. And do you know, there's a little side thought, that 99% of human rudeness is hidden. And they hide it. They'd like to blast you, wouldn't they? Well, do you sometimes want to be rude to people? Does that take you over? Same thing. All right. Someone is rude to you out in the world. Someone who you thought was your friend. Relatives. Let's get relatives in this. They're always good, for example. And you have finally broke through on a particular lesson you heard in this room. And you're driving in your car with two or three friends, let's say. And all of a sudden, in the general conversation while you're driving with several friends in the car, all of a sudden, right in the middle of the conversation, from the back seat, because you, you're in the front seat, you're a passenger, and all of a sudden, while that car is going along and everybody's conversing about the nice time they're going to have when they reach their destination, about their families and all that, all of a sudden, you hear something false coming from the back seat. A little tiny sly remark from your best friend. And that remark was something critical, something harsh. And you sensed that that friend in the back seat slipped, forgot himself. He, for, he or she forgot that he or she was your friend. You understand? And they, they just slipped and forgot themselves. And they said, which revealed how they really feel towards you. You know what I'm talking about? It's happened, hasn't it? Ah, oh, what an opportunity for you to make a new, the next declaration of independence. You don't say anything back to them, maybe, but here you are, seated in the front seat on the passenger side, look, looking ahead, and you heard that remark, and it was a little bit um, stunning at the start, and it wasn't clear in your mind but you know you heard something different, something that they weren't supposed to say, right? And you heard this little sarcastic remark, and at first it stunned you, then you yielded to the truth in it, you went beyond your hurt feelings, right? You went beyond your hurt feelings because you wanted to know the lesson in it, you yielded. And all of a sudden, the whole uh, uh, stage curtain collapsed, and you saw the whole horror show all at once, the whole cast of people up there, the horror show. And you know what you said is a great spiritual declaration of independence. Ah, oh, you, you'll wish you had said it 30 years earlier. Nobody knows you're saying it. Here you are, the conversation's still going on. You're seated in the front seat. And about one minute earlier, you heard this sarcastic remark about you from your best friend. And your mind makes the following declaration of independence. Look who I want for a friend. Of course you wanted her for a friend. You wanted her because you talked to her on the telephone. You associate with her. You have things in common. Look who I want for a friend, someone who is always stabbing in the back, and I don't see it, I didn't hurt. Wow, do you, do you know that you can develop 
your sense of spiritual hearing so that you can catch that in everybody all day long, anytime you want, <laughs> so that you can discern how they really feel towards you. And you can look at their faces too and catch that additional information. You can catch, you can begin to catch false friends out in the world there and that that's all you need. Are, are, are you going to are you going to tolerate having a, a traitor around in your life anymore when you know what he or she is really like? You find out you don't need traitors. You don't need charlatans who've been thinking one way towards you and saying another. Now, that's very good. Now I've got rid of most of your relatives. <coughs> Corrections. All your relatives. Now you get rid of your, your phony friends. Now for the hard part. That's the easy part. You need a lot of truth strength to do the easy part. Now for the hard part. Your, your false thoughts are also false friends. Your treacherous attitudes, attitudes of self-righteousness, attitudes that you attitudes that you can protect yourself. You can't protect yourself. You can only put yourself in danger. By knowing that, realizing it fully, that opens, that yielding to that opens the door to truth which can truly protect you. Story and illustration, we will all consciously and deliberately sit back and relax and listen to a nice story. See, you knew you changed position, didn't you? How many knew? How many changed without knowing it simply because I said to change? All right, next time, know that you change your physical position. That's the lesson in it. All right. Once upon a time, there was a salesman. And this salesman covered his route all over the United States by bus, commercial bus, simply because that was the best way for him to get from here to there to cover all his accounts. And he used the bus over a period of many, many years. And there was one route in particular, let's say from Iowa to Tennessee. You get on the bus in Iowa and it proceeded across the plains and the cornfields of Iowa and through mountains. And he took this route consistently once a week, making stops along the way to sell his products. He knew every move of the bus because he'd been on it so long. Follow and connect this with your interior life as I tell you the story. He knew when the bus would make a right-hand turn, when it would go through a tunnel, when it would cross a bridge, when it would stop for a railroad track. Because he'd gone over so many times, it was impressed upon his mechanical unconscious, right? You do that all the time. You, you know the road to come here, for example. You know it's going to turn left or right. Where. So he had this very well you know, imprinted into his memory which way the bus would be going next. So one day he was falling asleep. He'd been a busy day and he was, he was dozing. No reason why he shouldn't get a little relaxation before the next call. So he fell asleep. But as he did, he felt a strange discomfort, an uneasiness about it, which he didn't understand. And every few minutes he would, you know, jerk his head up and look out the window, and then he was too dazed to study what he saw at the window, so he fell back asleep again. And this went on for a period of a couple hours. And it now got into nighttime, and now it was dark, and he couldn't see out there too well. But he sensed something was wrong, and he didn't know what it was. This is parallel to the human experience. Finally, after a couple hours of this strange uneasiness, they came to a particular stop, and he got off the bus. And he could see the nighttime lights. He was in a, a new place he'd never been to before. And this was strange. He said, what am I doing here? I'm supposed to be in Fort Dodge, Kansas, and here I am in Davenport, Iowa, or whatever. He was in a, the wrong place. So he knew the bus driver, same bus driver over a period of years. So he went over to the driver and he said, well, what's going on here? I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be somewhere else. 
driver calmed him down. He smiled. You don't understand. I saw you sleeping back there, and I, I knew this would happen. Since the last time you took this trip, we changed the entire route. Everything is new. We've shortened it. We've improved it. We've made it better. So naturally, you're expecting to go right. Instead, we went, went left. All of a sudden, the whole thing became clear to him that they've simply changed the route. And he was expecting one thing, but getting another. Perfect example of what happens to us as we do yield to truth inwardly. You, you know, you're, how many of you are sleeping most of your life away anyway? On the bus, right, or wherever. But you're beginning to want to wake up a little bit. And there's this strange uneasiness where your old nature wants the bus to go left, but it goes right and it disturbs you. But you can't explain it to yourself, can you? You don't know what's going on. And so you fall asleep again, hoping your, your dreams will turn sweet instead of sour. But they don't. They continue to disturb you. So you fall asleep again. And you know the bus is supposed to make a, a stop at that railroad crossing in a certain town. And you're just expecting it. You know, your mind is half dazed. Instead of coming to the stop, which has been done a hundred times before, it goes right through it. Now you're worried. You're worried maybe the train will come along because the bus didn't stop. This is a period, a space of uneasiness which you must go through to go from what is the wrong route to the true higher route. You must go through this and you must endure and you must ask questions of the bus driver. You must stay awake. You must look out the window until you get so confused you are compelled to ask the bus driver, what's this all about? Aren't we on the wrong? You would vow, wouldn't you, that you're on the wrong path. See, you, you call the right path the wrong path because you've been on the wrong so long you have no choice but that. The old habit system. When the man became wise enough to just, just calmly go up. You know how we're afraid to admit that there's something confused in us? Afraid they'll laugh at us? You're afraid the answer might be bad? Always ask the heavenly bus driver about the change of route, the change of scenery. Whoa, you want a relief? If you want a relief real soon, then do that real soon. Ask truth why things are happening to you that are new and that you don't understand. What is happening to you is that you're getting a new life. Pity, pity the poor people who stay on that bus, who, who have the same experience but never ask. They're stuck. To keep the illustration going, they stay on, on that bus and they never learn what they could have learned, that they're on a higher route. And so they go to sleep and stay asleep all their lives never learning that that little bit of truth that they had been given, that, that, that caused a disturbance in them, but they fought it instead of yielding to it. Oh, now, now look how nice it is. I, I give you instructions and a, an invitation and a delight to just sit back and relax on the bus. The heavenly bus driver knows what he's doing. He knows where he's taking you. Your part is to simply have real confidence in him and let him guide the bus wherever it wants to take you instead of you insisting that the old way is better. You do that. You endure the pain. You go through it. You yield to the discomfort and you'll get safely wherever, wherever you really want to go. And you'll find that where you really want to go is where you are actually going. Your will now being God's will, God's will now being your will, there's no clash of wills. There's only one thing, and the end is a very, very peaceful place. There are three kinds of people in the world. There are common sickies. There are super sickies. And there are super healthies. We can... No, you can sense that a super healthy human being is very rare. And you, as you are now, would never be able to understand him. The only way you could know what a super healthy human being is like is to be one yourself. 
So if you really want to know, go all the way to the end of the highway, as he has done, and you will know what he knows, therefore you'll understand him, you'll think like he does, know what he does, and be victorious as he is, because the same light that he has, you will also have. Super sickies are in abundance. They are dedicated devils who have decided that the purpose of life, their life, is to destroy and to kill. Therefore, super sickies, dedicated devils, have the one aim in life to make common sickies like they are into a super sickie. Now we left, we're left with the common sickie classification. This is millions of people, but a common sickie has a chance. He can still do something for himself. He's not, he's not completely spoiled, as is a super sickie. You heard me say that he has a chance, an opportunity. There is still time for him to decide to determine which is the direction back to the main highway and to go back to the highway by following those instructions. He has not fallen in love 51% or more with hell. He's able to listen even though very confused about it and even though very fickle in his affection for the way on back. He can still be taken over. He can still be terribly bad off inside. He or she can be a very, very unpleasant human being. A common sickie can be extremely tired of living with himself as he now is. And he can be in a state where he just doesn't know what to do. And as long as that remains, he has a chance. Super sickie always knows what to do. He always knows. There's no, no doubt, no question. In his hardness, he follows the orders from his own hell, and that is all there is. It is settled for him. He's gone. A common sickie, we, we invite them here, still can go through the necessary stages to lose his ill health little by little and to walk a little lighter every time he does person who is what you call a just a commonly sick average man or woman who is who is not decided from himself that he knows what life is all about that person can go through some stages inside of himself he can go from from unseen badness to seen badness to non-personal goodness try it again unseen badness that means you're unconscious you don't understand, you don't know how your values are all mixed up, how you treasure things, that if you, if you could see what you're treasuring, you would be shocked. You're walking around in the darkness, unseen, an un, unseen, unexplored, unknown daily life, which is terrible because it always involves pain. When you walk in the dark, you always stumble and fall over the furniture and your shins get pretty pretty pained by it, don't they? And you get up and you <laughs> see, look, say you are in a big living room, lots of furniture in there, and the lights are out, and you stumble over a chair and fall down and hurt yourself, and you get up and you stumble this time over a couch and do a flip flop and land hard on your back and hurt your head. And each time that you get up, you say, oh, I've had it. From now on, I'm going to do better. I've determined that I'm not going to fall over the furniture anymore. <laughs> what good's that as long as the room is still dark? Now, that is what is known as total conceit. It is also called complete 
stupidity. You fall down, haven't you done this in the past? You fall down, you get hurt, and you say, that's the last time I'm gonna get involved with a man like that. <laughs> still in the dark, still ignorant, still filled with your own frantic desires, you get up and fall down again, and you make the vow again, make the vow and fall, vowing to falling, falling to vowing, getting up again. See how, how foolish human beings are when it never occurs to them, you have to do something else with your state of stumbling and getting hurt. You have to do something different from it than saying to yourself, I am going to do something different next time in order to stop myself from stumbling and falling. And you don't know, you should know by now what I'm going to tell you, that there is still great false destructive value in you feeling the pain of following, falling. <clears throat> you know the law of cause and effect. You know that when you walk in the dark, you're going to fall down, and you know when you fall down, it's going, to, it's going to hurt you, and you look forward to it all the time. See what this means? It means beginning to escape. When you start to wake up, it means beginning to escape from your own faults, confidence, <coughs> in your old ways, in your own abilities to tell yourself what you're going to do and then follow yourself. You can do that. You can tell yourself what to do and you can follow that and then you cry. It makes no difference what you think, what you say, your vows, your determinations, your convictions. <coughs> it makes no difference what you think as long as the room is still dark. You're still going to fall. You're still going to cry. You know, you know a state that always follows that sooner or later? And you can observe it in the world. Now, now make the room a little bigger. Like make it as big as this world. And furniture all in this enormous room. You know, a big dome over it, maybe. Dark, completely dark, hundreds of pieces of furniture, everybody falling down. And yet they get up and, bu and they bump into each other and fall apart, right? False human relation. And they all get up and they talk to each other in the dark as if the room is light. And they fight in the dark and lie about the reason why I'm fighting. You took away my rights. You cheated me. You threatened me. So I have a right. I have a right to hit you. That, that is the world of the super sicky and the common sicky. They both, they both have in common the fact that they stumble and fall all the time. But let's go on to uh, what the common, the super sicky, this is not for them. We, we never give talks for super sickies in this class. It's impossible. They want nothing. Our, the only thing we want to do with them is to get them out of that door and keep them away. We said that you are an unseen badness. You can go to seen badness. which you, you Seen badness means that you realize as you flounder around that room sobbing and hitting other people, you realize that you really are helpless as long as you think and act the way you do then you then you give up and by the magic of spiritual spiritual rules the light goes on you don't turn on the light switch you don't even know where it is or what it is but something is watching in that room that is not a part of the darkness it is watching those millions of people floundering around and you know what, what it sees, what, what this truth sees? It sees that one person in England, that one in the United States, that one woman in Ecuador, that one man in Australia. It sees that one person here or there who has collapsed on the floor and really, honestly, doesn't know what to do next. If you know what to do from yourself, 
you will get up and follow that self-dictate, bump into it again, and fall down again. Not knowing what to do means the beginning of the dissolving of the self-glorified self. And, and when you begin to dissolve it, listen to what you're saying to yourself. You are saying, oh, what a marvelous statement. You are saying, I no longer want to live this way. Do you, do you know what that is also saying? What a leap. You're going to have to make believe me. It's also saying, I also want to live. It is not life to bump and fall. It is not life to hate people and to hit them. It is not life to put on a big pretense that you're having a, an enjoyable party off in one corner of the big room. That's not life. It is lifelessness because it was all done in unknown unconsciousness. In other words, darkness is always hell and since most people love hell, that's where they continue to dwell. Now I said, eventually, if you go through all these stages, you will come to a state of non-personal goodness, non-personal virtue, non-personal action, non-personal thinking, non-personal emotionalizing, See, the road to deliverance and salvation therefore consists of draining all of the personal self away so that you're not there anymore. There is no you giving the orders. There is not even you saying, I'm going to uh, not get hurt anymore. Because maybe the false you is saying that and making its own determination that in its own strength it's going to do that. Have you noticed whenever you're really free of a problem, you don't think about it anymore in any way at all? Alcoholics, for example, think about liquor, don't they? They say, I'm going to take a drink or I better not take a drink, right? Like they always think about it one way or another, inside or on the surface, they think about it. When you're free, if you're free from alcohol, you don't think about it any way. No, no, no notice at all. You don't, the ads in the paper, don't, you don't even look at them. They, they're of no interest to you. Same way in the inner life. You're fighting, fighting a problem, you're going to keep the problem. The, the, if you're fighting with thinking about your solutions, it's going to stay there. Try sometime withdrawing you from your problem and see what happens to it. When you withdraw you from the difficulty, there's no difficulty because you're the only difficulty there is. But you won't accept that. You won't go for that. Too scary. Too chancy, you say. And so you hang on to hurting yourself and hurting others. Let, let me get off on just a little bit of a special point for a minute. It's, it is not pleasurable to live with an unpleasurable self. Now, intellectually, you know this. You know that you don't like yourself at all. You don't know, like the way you think, the way you behave, how you feel trapped. You don't, you don't like your little trickiness. You don't like what you suffer from. You don't like being scared. You don't like that. You find it all very unpleasant to be with you. The great revelation must come to you with a small glow of light at the start. You can never, never, never have you and pleasantness at the same time. If you want you, that is your choice, and you will have to pay the price of you living with you as you now act, believe, think, trick other people. 
As long as you want to be you, that's all there is for you. And oh, what a price. The price of you being alienated from God, from who you could be, and now you have so much pressure in you that that pressure is constantly making you be an unpleasant person toward yourself and others. Yes, you are. If you have not found yourself, if you're still a common sickie and haven't begun to rise above that, you were terribly unpleasant to all because you always, whether you know it or not, understand it or not, you always radiate yourself. You radiate what you are. You radiate your nature. You send it out, and everybody you meet catches it. They know it. And that is also, besides unpleasantness, called, you are called, besides being an unpleasant person, a very cruel person. Look what you're doing to your children. Look what you're doing to everyone because you have first done it unto yourself. Right. There's hope for a common sicky. He can see that the, the impersonal life is the only life he needs. You now think that your personal life is the only life you need and you fight struggle, scream, holler in order to maintain it. What, what could you do with the Niagara Falls energy in you fighting the truth if you yielded and let the truth fight for you? You're fighting against your own happiness, your own deliverance, your own light. You're fighting against your own pleasantness. You can, you can feel pleasant to yourself. You can walk around your house, you can walk through the supermarket, enjoying eternity right now. And that's what you are enjoying. What else? Isn't eternity escape from time, above time? You can never enjoy your time self. It's always a tormentor. It's always looking for some way for the, for the bats in your mind to fly down and, and uh, put you into dismay and discouragement <clears throat> and to make hideous, make hideous scenes in front of your, in, in the mental movies to scare you. Now I want to tell you a story. And this story is also a warning, a set of instructions, Something for you to take out of here and remember always so that the lesson can turn into help. There is a road, highway, that started at the bottom of a huge mountain chain. Not just one mountain, but a whole range of lofty mountains for hundreds of miles in length and in depth. And this highway passed through a small little town at the base of the first mountain. And from the base it went through the mountain passes and up over the peaks and down in the valleys and across the huge canyons. A long, long hundreds of miles journey for the motorist. But at the base of the first mountain there's a little resort camp, a little summer area where people were there all, all year long. And there was a car inspection station at the base of the mountain. And everyone who passed through went through the car inspection station. And the car inspector came out. He's a man who knew cars. He knew cars. He knew the mountain. Oh, yes, he also knew human nature. So he came out and looked at this car, that kind of a car, truck, whatever it was. And always, he found something wrong. And he would tell the motorist, Sir, unless you get this fixed, which you can be done right here in town, at very low cost, unless you get this fixed, 
sooner or later, you're going to have a breakdown in those mountains. Now, sir, I want to repeat what I just said. The inspector said to every single motorist, men, women. Sir, madam, miss, unless you get your car fixed, sooner or later, when you get up in those mountains, you're going to have a breakdown. You're going to be stranded. Maybe you'll be there for days. Nobody knows you're off somewhere, lost somewhere in the mountains. You got lost somehow. No one will be able to find you. And you're just going to break down and be a pretty desperate experience. You see, sir and madam, if you get your car fixed, you still have to go through the mountain pass and get on the other side. It's a long, several hundred mile journey. But if you get your car fixed, the car will be able to be superior to the mountain pass, to the roads, to all the hazards, to the storms, to the landslides. Your car will be strong enough to withstand them. Sir, get your car fixed now, and it, will, it won't happen to you. Now listen to this. Look, you've had this experience. I know you have. Once you break down, it's too late. It's done. It's happened. And you get up there, and sir, we have hundreds of people. I've been doing this for thousands of years, telling people about this. And they still go, and they break down. But everyone gets a chance. Most people didn't get their car fixed, and most people, when they get up into the mountain pass, either after 10 miles or 500 miles, they broke down. Now, you have had this experience in smaller ways, dozens of times, haven't you? Hundreds of times, where you had the sensing that you should have had your mind fixed. You should have had the, your ambitions repaired, put aside, something else, put it in a place more valuable. And all of a sudden, you broke down in the marriage, huh? It didn't work out. And you broke down in the financial investment. Your beautiful dreams turned into bubbles, and then the bubbles burst. All that, the pretty, pretty bubbles of colors of them burst in front of you. And you broke down. Now, in this, unless you listen to what I'm telling you right now, it will continue to happen to you just as it happened this morning. You broke down somewhere along the highway of life this morning, didn't you? And you, not only that, but you didn't know how to repair it. See, what you can do, any wise motorist can do, is watch the mechanic as he works and say, ah, I see, it needed a new bolt there, you needed a longer wire there. Ah, then you can immediately repair a breakdown, instant recovery, understand, instant recovery along the way. But you have to know how to do it for yourself. There's no mechanic anywhere along that mountain trail. You have to do it yourself, and you've been told that you can do it yourself. If you refuse, then like those people, you're going to suddenly find yourself in that very uncomfortable situation in this life in, in a dozen different ways, and you know it. Because you have a sensing always of, of forthcoming disaster, don't you? Well, not too big ones maybe, but a series of small ones. What if this happens or whatever? And you're always afraid of it. And then they do happen sometimes, and you get mad, or you cry stumbling over the furniture again. And, and you never listen to what, you were t what that mechanic told you at the start. And the, this class is now telling you, at the start of right now, that unless you inspect your life and make corrections, you will have no choice about it, absolutely, without question you will break down along the path through life. You will break down and you will suffer from it. And you may be lost for a long time. This class is so true to you by telling you, you must come to every class. You must learn what you must do, which is to sacrifice the junk 
the junk being your belief that you already understand the car so perfectly and you're in command of it that it's not going to break down, but it does. And it's going to break down for every one of you listening to me today. Because you stand there at the bottom of the start of that mountain pass and you stupidly argue. Whether you know it or not, you argue. Now look, a man who beats his wife breaks down. An alcoholic who gets those 20 bottles in one week, he breaks down. Now that's on the surface. Maybe you don't beat your wife. Maybe you don't drink. But I'll tell you something else you may not know. You still have the capacity to be aroused to violence. 